AJ, we all set. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship at McIntosh Presbyterian Church or wherever you're joining us around the world online. I welcome you in the name of Christ to Resurrection Sunday. Especially do we welcome those of you who are visiting with us today. Glad to have you. And we hope that you will experience the presence of the Holy Spirit and that we will all have ears to hear, that we may receive the grace of Christ. Um, got some announcements to make. Um, the flowers are, again, the wonderful work of Connie Shetler, uh, who has decided that Bob and I must be separated this morning. So she's sitting up here between us. By the way, there's a front pew right here available. <laughs> Second row's available over here. <laughs> good, good morning. I will tell you, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of amazingly appropriate that... Uh, uh, it, it is Resurrection Sunday, and so this morning about 6.30, our member, Dr. Ted Copeland, passed away. The other announcement I have is that next Sunday is communion and lunch. You are welcome and invited to, to attend. Also, when church is over, except for this bunch of flowers, you, you may come and take some home like we did the last three years. So help yourself to these beautiful flowers because they won't last a, another week. So we are here to worship God. Let's do that together, Bert.
As we continue to prepare our hearts for worship, if you would take your hymnal and refer to your worship guide, we're going to do stand together and we'll read responsibly and then we'll sing hymn 365 together. Let's stand together as we sing. Reading from your worship guide. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made made us alive alive with Christ, Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace we have been saved. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his own and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. Now let's sing together hymn 365. sing an Easter version of a popular song that y'all will be familiar with, I'm sure. And the words are printed in the insert in your worship guide. Feel free to sing along with us uh, on the choruses or whatever you feel free to to join us. Feel free to um, worship in that way. It's an Easter version of Hallelujah.
you would refer back to your worship guide. Here's another little responsive reading there. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Christ has risen indeed. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. He, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Somebody suggested that the presence of the thorn is obvious. Shame on you. <laughs> I call us now to a time of 
strange mixture of confidence in, in the love of God and humility because we know our need. So I call us to that time with two scriptures, one from the prophet Isaiah about the compassion of Jesus and the fact that he will not chase us, but he will always invite us. It says, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets, but a bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Therefore, Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, Pro proclaim his salvation day, today and every day. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering of our repentance and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Be still and reverent before him, all the earth. Let's do that together, availing ourselves of his willingness to forgive us our sins. I will give you a chance to pray silently after I begin, and then we, we will close together with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you deeply for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the linchpin of the gospel, the cornerstone of our faith, the fact that guarantees the validity of every promise of Scripture. Father, we lean into that today, thanking you for your promise of forgiveness. So we ask that you search our hearts, that we will not think more highly of ourselves than we ought, but that we would be willing to surrender to you, to repent, and to look to you for guidance as to how we live. So now, Father, you have gathered this people together here. We pray your rich blessing upon us as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth and through our confession. So hear us now, Father. Father, you know from your, we know from your word that if we are willing to repent, you are faithful and just to forgive us our transgressions and to remove the guilt of our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. That is a resurrection promise, Father, and we thank you that in the name of Christ, we claim today that forgiveness. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. If you would look in your worship guides in the insert, you'll inside the insert you'll find the words to the praise song.
Got one behind you, Rhonda. Any grown ups want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I have the uh, privilege this morning of again recognizing the faithfulness of this congregation through the years in financially supporting us to the extent that we have ministries far beyond these walls. And if you're new to us or if you're considering help, helping us financially, a lot of the church today has been politicized. This pulpit will never be politicized. Your politics or your business, Jesus never asked anyone if they were liberal or conservative. He looks in, in the heart, and that's between you and God. And you can be assured that whatever contribution you, you make to this church will be used for the furtherance of the gospel of Christ. So let's pray now, thanking him for his goodness and mercy and the generosity of his people. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are faithful, that you look upon the heart, and that you ask us to follow Jesus. Not an idea, not a philosophy, not a mantra, not a political persuasion, but Jesus the Christ. Help us to do that faithfully. And we thank you for the opportunity of participating in this portion of your church. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. I'm glad you all said that. Thank you. I need a hymnal. I'm going to sing this morning. <laughs> well, a couple of things before we begin. Uh, thank you, Bert and Debbie. We used to do mission work down in Miami in our previous lives, right? Some of you know what I mean by that. We were all Baptist in that day and time. <laughs> Secondly, I don't know, Tommy, I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks. First Press Gainesville, we took the offering after the sermon. You take it before. I think this is safer to take it before, okay? And then when you get up to preach, half the congregation goes there. So I know if there was a, if you got carded here, some of you would have to stay. So I'm glad that you stayed, okay? Today we're going to look at the resurrection, and I want to, to use two passages which I will not exegete completely, but I'm using them as a foundation to give you a broader view of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First is John 21 through 9. Uh, my favorite gospel is John because it's written differently than the other gospels, and he has such a, a beautiful way of writing. I think it's a literary genius piece, in my opinion, from studying it for many years. So hear the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled, removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That was the first race in the New Testament, okay, in case you want to know. Okay? He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's treatise on the resurrection. If you want to read the whole chapter, it would be a great read on, on Easter Sunday. Verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want, you, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. 
By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cyphus and the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and by the grace... And by his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Break us, mold us, make us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A Sunday school teacher was talking to her six-year-olds about the meaning of Easter. Children, she said, do you know why we celebrate Easter? A little girl raised her hand. Yes, Jenny, said the teacher. Jenny said, Easter is when we put on costumes and go out trick-or-treating. No, Jenny, that's Halloween. Does anyone know why we celebrate Easter? A little boy yelled, it's when we have fireworks. No, Jimmy, that's Independence Day. Does anybody else? A shy little girl in the back said, Easter is when Jesus died. The teacher saw a ray of hope, just a ray. That's right, Shauna. And what happened to Jesus that makes Easter special? Well, he died and got buried, and every Easter he comes out, and if he sees his shadow, there are six more weeks of winter. <laughs> I just had to use that, okay? It's a great story, isn't it? But here's the point I want you to hear. That is not exactly what Easter is about. Jesus resurrected, and he didn't go back into the grave, right? Hallelujah. The little children's story is cute, perhaps funny. It draws our attention, though, to the most important thing, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Do you hear that? For we believe that Jesus died, rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. It's about the rapture. But the point I want to make here is, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to think Jesus comes out and goes back in. I want you to know that he came out and he will never return back in because he's alive today. He's in heaven. He is our king of kings and lord of lords. He reigns beside the father and he is risen and he will not go back in the grave. So I thought, how can I help you frame that? And so if I re retitle the sermon, I titled the sermon, The Resurrection Changes Everything because it does when Christ comes into your life. If I were to retitle it again, I would say Resurrection 101. That would fit into an educational community, don't you think? I had breakfast with Dr. Fox, the former president of the university, a couple of weeks ago, and, and he's back at the university teaching a class on Engineering 101. And I thought, what a great idea. Let's have 101 for resurrection for us. So I want us to look at it. Uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, there I just read, first importance. With this in mind, the followers of Jesus Christ ought to be very well versed on the resurrection because it is the foundation of our belief, and without it, it's all in vain. So the resurrection can be viewed from at least four perspectives. So if you're a linear person, I'll give it to you this way. We're going to give it from the Old Testament to Peter, okay? Now, if you're a circular person, we're going to give a 360-degree look at the resurrection, 
Okay, you got that? Because some of you like to think this way, and some of you just keep running in circles, right? So here we go. The four perspectives. The prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. It's important to understand. When, when someone said to me one time in seminary that Old Testament was not important. Wrong. Everything we believe as Christians is built upon what we find out about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. It's the foundation. So the Old Testament about the resurrection. The proof of the resurrection from the Gospels. If you don't know those, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? The prediction of the resurrection by Jesus himself. And then the transformative proof of the resurrection in the life of Peter. Now, for those of you who are keeping time and want to know when we're going to get done, those are the four pieces so you can follow and know where we are in the process. Okay? There's no thing about teaching and preaching. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today, all right? The prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. Psalm 61.10 says, a Psalm of David, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Jesus did descend into hell, but he didn't stay there. Why? Because he was resurrected. He didn't decay. And so there's a hope. There's a word of hope right there beyond the grave. And then Job. Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Job is one of my favorite characters. But I, gosh, if you read that first part where God says, you can do this and you can do this, sometimes that scares me. Would it scare you? You know, God said, oh, you can do anything but don't touch his body. And then he says, you can do anything but don't kill him. But Job says this, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron two on lead or engraved in a rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand on the earth. You hear the hope of the resurrection in the Old Testament. He says, my Redeemer will live. You know what? My Redeemer is living. How about yours? And then Jesus uses the Old Testament in the narrative of Jonah. People tell me, oh, Jonah's just a, you know, it's a fairy tale. I really want a guy named Jonah. I don't believe that. Why would Jesus refer to that about his own resurrection when he said, he answered them, this is out of Matthew, uh, Matthew 12, 39 and 40. He answered them, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of the prophet who? Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, by the way, it didn't say whale, it says huge fish. So the son of man will be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. Here Jesus from the Old Testament is what? Prophesying from what was prophesied by the prophets about his own resurrection. So that's the first one. What is it? The proof of the Old Testament. Okay? Stand with me. Secondly is the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the Gospels. I use a C.S. Lewis story to introduce this. Uh, C.S. Lewis, if you haven't read C.S. Lewis, then give it a shot. Mere Christianity, don't give up on it. Took me three times to really kind of, kind of get into it, okay? Uh, but great books he's written. One was called, some of you, how many of you read uh, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia? Anybody read those? Yeah, great work. It's a delightful scene in C.S. Lewis' classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Illustrates a way that we ought to look at the, the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the Gospels. Here's what happened. Lucy reports to her siblings Peter, Edmund, and Susan, that she was transported into another realm via the magic wardrobe. They are incredulous to the point of worrying about her sanity. So they take her to see the eccentric old professor in whose home they were staying. He listens to her complaints and then responds with some of his own incredulous thoughts. Logic, said the professor, half to himself. Why don't they teach logic at schools? There are only three possibilities here. Either your sister is telling lies or she is mad or it's the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies and it's obviously that she's not mad. The professor concludes through what? Through logic that it's true. So how about if we look at the scriptures, the gospels about the resurrection and use the same thoughts. If the witness is saying, which Lucy was, and the other alternatives were false, which they were, it's rational to believe the eyewitnesses. 
Well, number one is, I don't believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were insane. And I truly believe they're not lies because lies don't last as long as the Gospels have with all the Bible has been through through all the centuries and it has survived. It is the Word of God. It is the eyewitness account. So we're only left to do what? Believe it is true. A quick review of the Gospels. Matthew, written to a Jewish audience. Mary Magdalene and Mary go to the tomb of Jesus. There's an earthquake. The angel of the Lord has already rolled away the stone. The angel says, don't be afraid. You ever notice all the way through the scriptures when the angel appears, don't be afraid? It's kind of an interesting thought because if an angel really appeared to us, we'd probably be afraid, right? I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. On the way back to Galilee, Jesus met them, and they fell at his feet, and they worshiped him. Mark, written to a Roman audience, he adds, Salome goes with them. They go to the grave early on the first Easter. The stone is what? Rolled away. The tomb is what? You can fill in the blank with me. Empty. The angel there said, do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is, was crucified. He is what? Risen. Good. Y'all doing good. You're doing good. He gave them a command. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Very interesting phrase. In fact, I have a whole other Easter sermon on Peter. Maybe another year. He was the one who promised never to leave Jesus and would then deny Jesus three times. This is a good word for Peter. When Jesus said, tell them especially whom? Peter. Don't you think that was a word of healing and reconciliation for his forgiveness? That he had been, don't you think that Friday through Sunday was a long time for Peter to think about what he had done? Now, none of you have ever done something like that. that you did and you mulled over for three days. Wishing I could take that back. Jesus is resurrected. And it's a resurrected word to Peter. Luke. Luke is seen as a good historian. By the way, he wrote the most of the New Testament. Did you know that? The largest part. Why? He wrote Luke and Acts. And in that we find he always emphasized these two groups. Women and the marginalized especially the poor. Again, the woman, Luke says, early goes to the Easter morning to the tomb. Jesus and the, the tomb is what? In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is. Remember how he told you why he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day he will what? rise again, and they remembered his words. If we go on the rest of Luke 24, at the end, we find where he's on the road to Emmaus with the disciples, and he appears to them. They don't recognize him. And he said to them, how foolish are you and how slow to believe what the prophet spoke. The women had told these two disciples that Jesus resurrected. Jesus did not say anything negative about not believing the women, but he did say, why haven't you believed the prophets? I go back to my first point, the Old Testament. Jesus diverted their attention from their grief to something more significant, their unbelief. More importantly, they should believe the scriptures. And after all, Jesus explained the scriptures taught the necessity of Christ's suffering and the subsequent glory. Where are we in our unbelief today? The world keeps telling us that didn't happen. It's all a fairy tale. Let me tell you what, folks. It happened. We have more than the prophets of the Old Testament. We have the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. John, the fourth Gospel. It's not a synoptic Gospel. Synoptic means similar. If you take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll find 40 to 60% of the material is the same. But when you come to John, he gives us a narrative look at the life of Jesus. From creation all the way through, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a creation piece. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus and finds it empty, returns to tell the disciples. Peter and John run to the tomb. The tomb was empty except for the grave clothes. I love that part where John, who is the disciple whom Jesus loved, if you follow the Gospel of John, outran Peter. 
But it's also interesting, John didn't go in until Peter went in, which is a sign of Simon Peter. Don't you know he's always hoof and mouth disease, always putting his foot in his mouth of saying things out of context. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and believed. Did you get that? And believed. But they still did not get the concept that Jesus had to die. So here are the gospel accounts. So let me put it in this frame. Let's all say we went out here and we saw a car wreck on 441. There were f all of us would have a different view. Would you agree? But because we had a different view didn't mean the wreck didn't happen, right? Same with the gospels. Just because there's a different view from four different writers about what happened, a little difference in who appeared, at what time they appeared to see, there's some basic things. The resurrection happened. All of them agree on a certain thing. The tomb is empty, Jesus is not there, and he is resurrected. That's what we base our stuff on. That's what we base everything that we should do in our life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. First one is what? Old Testament. Second one is Gospels. The third one is what Jesus said himself. Luke and John remind us of the disciples' prediction. Matthew 16, 21, if you want to look at it. For that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. Here it is. Now, I always put in the frame Dr. Bill Bright. Anybody ever heard of him? Founder of Campus Crusade. He was a member of my church in Orlando the last three years of his life. But when I was a young pastor, hadn't been to seminary, I was doing youth work in Longwood, Florida. Anybody know where that is? North of Orlando, in case you want to know, okay? I was counting my fingers and coming up with 9-11 about what to do in ministry. I, I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge. So I went to the local bookstore, Christian bookstore, and I said to the guy, give me some materials to help me lead youth. He gave me Bill Bright's materials, Four Spiritual Laws. And there's a little drawing in the back of the four spiritual laws of a train. And the train is this. The engine is facts. The coal car is the faith. Because only faith will lead the facts. Do you see that? And the caboose is what? Feelings. Because we cannot allow our feelings to guide our beliefs. Because the caboose takes a train nowhere. So here we have the facts of the resurrection, and now we must do what? We must put faith to it for it to actually happen. I must feed that coal engine with coal for it to work, and for it to be driven, and for my life to be a resurrected life. So the first one was what? Old Testament. Some of you may be with me, okay? Second one is what? God, we got a few. Okay. The third one was what? The life of Jesus, his predictions. The fourth one is the transformed post-resurrection life of Peter. Now, we've all heard about Peter. And, you know, he's in the upper room with Jesus. By the way, I went to the upper room when I was in, in Jerusalem, but we had to go downstairs. I hadn't figured that out yet. Uh, but that's what they say. So I'm trying to think, is that really the upper room? Okay. So in that... Here, they're, they're in the upper room, and they're having dinner, and, and it's the institution of the Lord's Supper, and Jesus said, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. His prediction. Upon hearing this oversight, Peter did what? Boldly speaks out. Why do we say that? Peter is always listed first in all the places in the New Testament where the disciples are listed. He's the spokesperson. Though all men desert you, yet I will not, Peter said. But Jesus said, I say that before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter was shocked. He said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And then we know what happens. It was a gatekeeper. Aren't you one of them? Peter said, no. Moments later, by the fire, there stood this one and said, aren't you the fellow who is with Jesus of Nazareth? Peter said, no. And then suddenly a man appears to him and asks him the question, didn't you, didn't you appear with him in the Garden of Gethsemane? And Peter said, what? No. And then what happens? The cock crows. 
Immediately, Peter remembers these words that Jesus said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And when he realized this, the scriptures say, He sank to the ground and he wept bitterly. Some people have said the most evident piece of the reality and the truth of the resurrection is the evidence and the significance of changed lives of the followers and believers of Jesus Christ. Whenever I hear that, I go back to the song we used to sing in the 70s. If there was enough evidence, is there enough evidence to convict you if you were put on trial for being a Christian? Think about that. If we were bringing up, you put on trial, and we have all these witnesses about you, would there be enough evidence in your life to show and prove that you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ? I don't know if I want to be put on trial. How about you? So here we have, this is the peace. And we find this transformation. Some people call Peter's life and change the greatest comeback in spiritual history. Paul might be up there too. There's some great comebacks in athletics. Michael Jordan, you ever heard of him? He gave up baseball and went back and won three uh, NBA championships. Not bad for a goat, right? You know what goat means, don't you? Greatest of all time. Red Sox came back from 3-0 deficit to overcome the curse of the Bambino. 2017 Super Bowl. The Pacers are down 21-3 at halftime. A lot of those comebacks. I have some other ones I mentioned, but I lose you off. I mentioned my team instead of yours. Peter, one of the greatest spiritual comebacks. After the resurrection, in the same community, in the same place that Jesus was put on trial, Peter steps up, raises his voice, 3,000 plus people quiet themselves, and he speaks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people come to faith in him, in Jesus. On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, Jesus had breathed into them the Holy Spirit. And Peter received that spirit. Separation from Pentecost. The disciples had already received the Holy Spirit. When Peter goes out and he preaches and he teaches about the resurrection. And they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. He suddenly becomes not this, not this person who's denying Jesus Christ. But this person who is defending his Lord and Savior with the truth of the resurrection to the people around. And they went on and they, were, they faced a lot of persecution. But Peter and John were faithful. All of the disciples faced that. If you really want to read the studies of the life of the disciples, it's not the best way to recruit people to Christianity. Because they all suffered really bad. But they stood true to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we see this change in Peter. Do you hear that? And what was it? It was the resurrection. And they continued to do that. Because of what happened in Peter's life, we can have the same power in our lives when we take the resurrection of Jesus Christ and take it seriously and live into the resurrection, not away from it. It's the Old Testament who teaches us that Jesus will die and resurrect. It's the Gospels that teach us that Jesus resurrected. It's Jesus himself who predicted and fulfilled his own prediction to be a resurrected, reigning Lord and Savior. And then we see the life of Peter, who was changed by the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to become this bold leader of the church of Jesus Christ. Acts 4.13 says it this way, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and ignorant men, they marveled at them and knew that they had been what? With Jesus. Do you hear it? So my question goes back to the question the teacher asked the sixth grade pupils. Why do we celebrate Easter? Because he is risen. Let's see if you're coachable. He is risen. He is risen. Do you get it? It's not that he goes in the tomb and comes out for 
a few minutes, goes back in the tomb. He is out of the tomb. So here's the questions. Have you invited Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your life in light of the hope of the resurrection? If you haven't, Tommy and I are here, Bert's here. We would love to talk to you about this being the best Easter you ever had because you've invited Jesus Christ to come in and be your resurrected Savior. And if you are a Christian, here's the question. Have you invited Jesus Christ to be your resurrected Lord and Lord of your life? Savior is one thing. Living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ is another. And so I invite you to consider both this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Soli Deo Gloria. Amen. Am I supposed to pray now? Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we are truly, truly honored. We are truly favored by your grace in the hope of the resurrection. Father, help our lives to flourish for you because we have taken these words from the Old Testament, from the gospel, from Jesus, and from the life of Peter to help us to understand truly why we celebrate Easter. So, Lord, I pray today that you would be with Ted Copeland's family. Kind of ironic and interesting how you do things, Lord. Probably the best Easter he ever had. 6.30 on Sunday morning, 6.30 on Easter Sunday, he comes into the presence of his Savior and his Lord. And we thank you for his faith in you. So, Lord, that's why we celebrate Easter. As Paul wrote in Thessalonians, that we would not be uninformed. That the resurrection is about us moving from creation and fall and redemption to the celebration of the restoration of all of us and all things being made new because of what Christ has done for us. So Lord, help us to be really good with Resurrection 101. Help us to be able to answer why do we celebrate Easter and help us, Lord, to live as if the resurrection changes everything, because it does. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your hymnals again and turn to him 358, 358, because he lives. Let's stand together as we sing.
worship God the Apostles Creed that you would join me in affirming our faith the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary suffered in the Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of god the father almighty from thence he shall come to judge the great and the dead i believe in the holy ghost the holy catholic church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting just so you know, I do know the Apostles' Creed, but I never want to lead it without it in my hands. Okay? <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, just a word, if I may. Uh, we are here if you need to have conversations about your spiritual journey. That's why we do this. It's because we want to help people on that spiritual journey. So Tommy and, and I are here. Bert's here. We have others who are here to help those conversations. So let me leave you with this, if I may. Happy Easter. And I pray that this will be a, a resurrection day for you where you celebrate what Christ has done for you. With this benediction, before Bert and Debbie lead us in our little chorus here at the end, may the living Lord Jesus go with you today. May he go above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to protect you, underneath you to give you strength, within you to bring you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen. And your uh, worship guide, but it's the, it's the chorus part, the refrain of the, the hymn, Christ Arose. I think you uh, have already heard it once today. Ready?